Good afternoon. This is Steve with another exciting edition of Alliance of the Sacred Sun. So we have finally, finally going to start the Let's Play. This is the extended series. This is on 8.3C. Um, what I'm going to do is record these and also have the save game available, the base save game available for anyone that wants it. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, we're going to start a new reign. Now we're going to start a small empire. Um, the The advantages of a small empire is that the other houses are not nearly as strong and they can't do as much. So obviously this is an area where we're going to do a lot of balancing. Uh, also for performance purposes, you try probably want to keep it fairly small. Um, so we keep it small. So next we're going to choose the culture. So there are six different what they call inner rim cultures. Um, we have Neo-American, Traditionalist, Technic, Mercantile, Gilded Worlds, and Spartic, and each have their own advantages. Neo-American is kind of an all-rounded culture. They're pretty good at everything. Uh, Traditionalist is kind of your religious, uh, kind of back to basics, think kind of Puritanism. Uh, Technic is sort of your, uh, as it sounds, uh, very uh, technical, um, very futuristic, <clears throat> cybernetic, that kind of thing. Uh, mercantile, obviously interested in money and wealth and uh, good at trading. Gilded World's a little bit different. They're mainly interested in government um, and, and kind of uh, keeping their people um, well well fed. It's, uh, they're a little bit more effete. And then Spartak is primarily military and, and exceptionalism and, and in keeping them. So Neo-American is kind of the most well-rounded. So we'll go ahead and start there. Um, we'll call ourselves Hawk Wild with an E. And we'll give our style like this one here. This is obviously... All right. Now, choosing your house traditions is very important. Um, I like to have a good government tradition because that determines the amount of ADM you have for your projects. I like to keep it around 50. Also, we have academic tradition. Um, basically, the higher the academic tradition, the better your scientists are and the more uh, points you get towards reform. So I'll, I'll keep that about 40. Economic tradition helps basically the better that is, the better your viceroys are at taxation and getting money out of the economy. So I like to keep that around 40, 45 as well. Uh, manufacturing, the higher this is, the more efficient your factories are, which means you generate more build points to build more things on your planets. So keep that pretty high. Farming is not typically that important. I'll probably need to balance this at some point. Energy can be important. And then mining, you like to have a steady supply of minerals. So um, most important, government and academic. Of course, depending on how you role play, it may change. And finally, we look at the empire creation. Emperor creation, we'll just call ourselves Stevonius. And it doesn't really matter at this point, but these are all gonna be changing. You'll be able to soon select your, um, your portrait. So, all right, so we are starting a new turn. So we're gonna do about four turns. The first let's play may only be uh, the first turn or two because there's a lot to go over in the first turn. Um, we'll just kind of play it by year and obviously a lot depends on the starting situation. So uh, the game should just about load. One of the nice things about this version is that it's a lot faster. Um, it's been optimized quite a bit. So the first turn only takes, uh, takes a lot less time. All right, so we've got, uh, well, we've actually got uh, two Looks like we've got two uh, constellations that have been uh, colonized, which is interesting. Typically, when you have a small star, it's only one, but I guess this one starts pretty close. All right, so the first thing I like to look at pretty much right away is I like to look at my economic sphere. Um, there's a lot of things that you can kind of look at early. So I have one province trade group over here. So the way pra trade groups work is that you have one province hub per constellation, and each constellation holds one province. And then each system can have one system hub. And now if the system hub is connected to the province hub, then you have a trade group. And trade can, can go freely between any um, planets within that hub that have at least a trade port. Um, but as you can see, none of these are connected. I've got two system hubs, but they're different colors because they're only the one trade group. So they can only trade within planets within their trade group. Um, I, you see, if I zoom in closer, I do have a trade group here. So I knew and uh, Shaohao form one trade group. You see they're the same color. And then over here, I've got one province hub for Esquera. Um, I've got, this is the only uh, colonized planet I have over here though. So if I were to colonize these planets and build a trade hub, then they would be included in a trade group as well. So this line here is red. That means that this province trade hub is not sending 
uh, materials my way. Um, each province trade hub, the system governor of that, prov of, of that system that has the province trade hub can determine whether or not to send goods. Generally, if you have a poor relationship with that house, uh, they won't send goods. You have to talk to the system governor. Here, uh, they are sending goods. It is green, and you can see also uh, this color here. So basically, you want to see green lines. So you want to go from the system hub to the province hub to Neosiris. So that's how uh, materials flow. Um, each, um, each house is obligated to send 25% uh, of their uh, uh, mined goods uh, to Neosiris. Uh, is they're participating in the trade unless of course they're not which this person's not so I want to take a look at that now so I'm gonna go let's see Governor Lancel Kirby okay so this is all right so let's take a look this is Van Rigel so this is kind of a tough start because I don't have any friends everyone's in Cold War which is actually a very difficult start I may I'll uh, see what I can do with this <clears throat> but typically you want to have at least one friend so my goal is to try to get at least one friend in a hurry. As you can see, no one really likes me very much. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of rivals and vendettas going here. So, um, well, we'll see what we can do. Why not? So Van Rigel, it's their house. So this would be a nice way. Obviously, um, they don't like me very much, but this person is afraid of me. Um, they're shunning me, which basically means that uh, they're kind of ignoring me. So their power is not very high. So a big part of Alliance of the Sacred Sons is relations between characters and a big part of getting them to do what you want them to do is the power imbalance which is why power is so absolutely critical to the game. Uh, I'll kind of go on a tour of the main screen but um, basically that's you want to keep your power as high as possible because when it gets lower uh, unless people are friends with you already or they're friendly houses they're going to be less likely to do what you ask simply because they're awed by the emperor's power so um <clears throat> so right now let's see what i can do let's go to assignment actions so this is the action for demand trade network participation so this essentially this is me asking the system governor to open up the um the trade all right so your grand vizier will give you kind of his view on whether they will say yes or no so th this is called the decision score and, and right now because i don't know him that well it's a pretty big range but it's uh pushed up against your power and this decision score is calculated by a lot of variables. Um, your persuasion is among them. Obviously, your power is among them. <clears throat> your relationship is among them. Your house's relationship is among them. Um, but uh, your, your personal uh, uh, traits do matter. So we're going to go ahead and try because it looks like he will exceed. Okay, so he did say yes, so that's good. So that cost me one action point. So now, next turn, uh, I should get those goods. All right. So let's take a look at me. So I am 18 years old, that's where I start. Uh, my house has 1,107 power, which as you can see is good because you want, I'm way more powerful than the other houses here. This is their power. Um, you, in a change, you actually know their exact power. Intel will give you more information about their holdings and their resources, but you do always know their power. So the good news is, even though I have a lot of houses that hate me, none of them are especially powerful and only Van Rigel has more than one holding. This is the amount of holdings they have, so that's always good. All right, <clears throat> so let's take a look. I don't have anybody in my what's called my inner circle, and that's my five closest friends. A big part of the game is called Spirit. So Spirit is basically your mental health. As you do things that make you happy as an emperor, um, talking to people that you like, doing things that you like, um, doing things that are kind of in alignment, alignment with your personality, which I'll show you in a minute, then you um, you gain the spirit. And spirit actually is what allows you to get more uh, XP. I'm sorry, action points. You see here on the tooltip, right now I have a five base action points, but my spirit adjustment is plus zero. I'm content right now, but if I go happy or ecstatic, then I can get up to um, three AP in addition per turn. And I also have a health adjustment. Right now I'm young and healthy, so I'm robust, and you can see that here as well, and this will tell you. So <clears throat> these are my stats. So intelligence is basically kind of a catch-all. It, it, it affects a wide variety of things you do, particularly with actions that have a, a, a fail. Likeability and persuasion kind of go together um, when you are trying to convince someone to do something. Uh, Likeability is, is kind of, in general, makes it easier for you to uh, gain more trust when you... Um, do an action that they like. Uh, gaining trust is the way to improve your um, relationship with the character, which I'll go into in a bit. Persuasion is used 
when you're persuading someone to do something. So that directly impacts the decision score. Now you see I have a terrible persuasion score. I'm a very likable guy, but I don't have a very good argument for things. So, um, <clears throat> so that actually makes it harder for me, much harder for me to uh, persuade even if I have less power. So I, I'm gonna have to rely, I mean, they're gonna have to work on getting that up or rely on having a lot of power to get people to do what I want them to do. Intimidate is used in an intimidation action. So I'll show you, um, we'll kind of go back to this. Um, I'll go back and so I could, let's just say I want to get to know the character. Now I can do a friendly stance or I can do an intimidate stance. Now you see um, the decision score changed by me intimidating um, because, well, and you see there's a big gap. But basically when you intimidate, and I'm not a very good intimidator, so it's really not helping much, but you're, you will add a significant amount of your score towards the decision score. Um, you want it to go lower uh, when you intimidate. So you see when I intimidate, it's, it, decision score drops 91. Um, now, of course, when you intimidate someone, um, their grudge level will increase and their trust will drop. So if you get intimidate someone to get something done, um, that can work, but it's not often the best idea, especially they may hold a grudge, which means they may uh, plot against you or if they belong to your house, they may leave your house. So, uh, And then finally, watchful is uh, you gathering information. It's a kind of a way of you gathering uh, rumors and uh, just kind of when talking to people, um, finding out more about them. Um, it, it affects primarily when you uh, get to know a character and things where you directly interact, you gain more uh, intel from them depending on how high this is. So, All right, so we're gonna look at the skill tree. Now we have three actions right now, only two are active. We can rest, which takes all our AP. And this basically improves our spirit and our health, uh, but it takes all the rest of our AP. And the more AP you have remaining when you rest, um, the more effect it has. You can engage in a hobby, which we can actually do. Um, and uh, your uh, spirit will go up just a little bit. It's just kind of something to do that makes you happy. Uh, and managing your spirit is actually a very big part of the game, especially when the traits are taken into consideration. <clears throat> and we'll see that here in a little bit. Uh, and then engage in study is something you can do once it's unlocked and you have to have a specific skill to do that. So let's take a look. All right, so this is a big new system, the skill tree. Um, this will eventually be expanded for quite a, quite a bit. There will be about 120 different traits that you can, that you can get. Uh, these are your personal development points. Um, in the build, I guess you'll eventually start out with one. I'm using five to kind of show what you can do. I haven't changed that. And then this is your personal development experience. Everything you do uh, with characters, pretty much everything you do in the game that interacts with anybody, you will get uh, experience for that. So once you get 100 experience, you will get a new point and you'll get an event when that happens. So right now your current personality, and that's basically just to kind of give you an idea of, of, of who you are. It doesn't really affect much in game. However, um, your uh, personality scales, the closer that someone else is to you in these scales, uh, the easier it is for them to uh, like you more or like you less. So. You have uh, three primary categories. Um, these are kind of your broad categories. The habitus, uh, which is kind of your ties into your piety and, and studying and basically your seriousness. Uh, predictability, um, this is kind of who you are as a person. Um, you know, how you can either be predictable or jovial or kind of a clown. It kind of has your, your, your professionalism. And then your openness, and I have not uh, uh, put that one in yet, but that's gonna be more about uh, kind of you as a person, how outgoing you are, um, how, how uh, basically are you the life of the party or are you kind of introverted? Um, so all these different traits kind of form, gradually form personality. And <clears throat> you can see that these four are already opened up. So you have tooltips on each one, tells you whether or not whether they're available, gives you a little um, description of, of what, what happens when you take it. It gives you any requirements. So some of them, like these, have no requirements. So you can go ahead and click them. They're open. This one here is not shaded, so it's unavailable. This one requires bookish. You, you can see it's got the little thing to it. Detail-oriented requires pedant and well-informed. So, and some of them require a certain scale, like certain hu humanity or piety level, and it will tell you that as well. Um, and some of them will not work if you have another category. So uh, you can be open but not closed, that sort of thing. So, and of course you see the effects. Um, some of them uh, take place right away, some of them a little bit later. So bookish uh, will unlock the study emperor action. So it's a little bit more expensive. Um, typically with the newest star of the game, you, uh, you'll only have one AP, but I'm gonna go ahead and select it. So you can see now pedant has opened up and now detail oriented. I can open it up with pedant and well informed um, if I choose to book them. So now when I go back, uh, when I reopen the 
I can now uh, engage in study. So what study does right now, it'll be a little more expanded as we move on, but for now, it will increase your spirit a little bit and it may increase your intelligence. If it's low to begin with, it has a better chance. So let's try engaging in study. Okay, it didn't go up. Okay, still didn't go up. But generally when it gets, if it's, unless it's really low, unless it's like 20, it probably won't go up very much. Um, just to prevent it from being, you know, just easy to click, click, click and get your intelligence up. Uh, once it starts getting above 60 or 70, it's almost impossible to get up any higher. So, um, so, so when I look at that, so I kind of look at my skill tree. I'm going to look at my scale. Now we start at three. All the scales go from zero to uh, six. So three is kind of in the middle. So uh, zero and one are considered low on these scales. Uh, five and six are considered high. So honor basically how likely you are to keep your word. <clears throat> Players that have eye honor uh, will definitely respect you more and they'll be a lot more likely to do what you ask as long as you uh, follow through with what you say you'll do. Um, humanity is probably the most important trait. This is kind of your good and evil uh, slider. Um, not necessarily. If you think of honor and humanity together, um, if anyone's played Dungeons and Dragons, you know how you'd have kind of lawful evil, chaotic evil, chaotic good. So this is kind of this combination. So you can have a low honor and low humanity, and that would be kind of chaotic evil, whereas you can have a high honor and low humanity, and that would be lawful evil. Um, it's not quite the same thing, but it gives you kind of some, a, a way to kind of understand. So, um, so what this does is humanity <clears throat> and honor and piety. So um, obviously they affect how other characters see you if they have low humanity, and you have low humanity, they'll like you a little bit more. Uh, as events and stories come through, you will have the opportunity for benevolent uh, choices or tyrannical choices, and they will hurt or help your spirit depending on the humanity you have. So just to kind of show, not that I want to play an evil character, I'm going to go ahead and lower my humanity down to one, which means I'm, I'm kind of evil, um, just to kind of show the uh, effect. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. It just shows that a bunch of stuff's been built. Uh, okay, so here we have a global event, and this is kind of a new thing. Uh, at the start of every game, we have a new event. So your journey begins. You'll get several events at the beginning to kind of start to build you as a character. Um, you'll fall into a deep sleep. You are dreaming of your impending coronation. You hope to learn all the lessons. The old crisis has been frantically trying to stuff into your imperial brain, but there are days when it all seems too much. As you ponder your first day as emperor, a flaming phoenix appears before you and appears to cock its head towards you quizzically. Though birds cannot speak, of course, you hear a deep, crackling contralto coming from its flame-licked beak. What will your reign become? So this is kind of what do you want to be known as? What do you believe? You know, what will you be known for? I'm kind and merciful. Now, because I have low humanity, this is the benevolent option, but this will cost me 50 spirit because I'm a pretty evil guy. I've set myself up that way. So it will actually make me feel bad to take a kind action. Um, whereas if I was benevolent, it would, it would make me feel bad to take a tyrannical action. So we call that the burden of guilt system. Uh, we'll go into that a little more as that, that evolves. And then some other ones. This is a, uh, um, this is a, a, a diplomatic decision. And, and the different types of decisions, they have different uh, icons. This is a military one, tyrannical, benevolent. There's also intel. Um, there's also special. There's also um, science. So, uh, And these kind of tie into your... Um, your uh, primes. The better your primes are, the better chance you have of a positive outcome. So sometimes you want good primes, just like you want good government. It's not always about the, um, not always about the politics of it. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and I believe that a strong military, I look to involve my council. I believe in getting them involved. So I'll go ahead. So now look, my inspired trait changed by 25 and I got a plus 10 spirit, which yay. So now when I go here, um, this is kind of my persuasion. Um, <clears throat> you see now it went up to 31, so um, which is kind of nice. So now I have a little bit better chance of actually, um, you know, getting people. These are going to be called different things. We're inspire is actually what they're going to be called. Finally, we just need to get around to changing the the labels on here. <clears throat> so this will be inspire. Um, this will be charm, uh, intimidate, and then uh, intelligence and watchfulness will be the same. So anyway, all right, so. Now we got an alert for the budget. So now we're gonna take a look at the budget. So a big part of the game is going broke. You do not wanna go broke. So the good news is I have an outstanding financial prime. This 115% means that he is, uh, he is collecting actually a surplus of the expected tax. So he's contributing an extra 15% above what I would expect the tax to be. So in other words, so New Terra, their total gross planetary project product is 374 billion credits right now, as of now, of which, my share is 280, which is 
Now he is going to collect an extra 15% on top of that. So that is all going to go here. You always start out with 500 billion to kind of have a starting budget, even if your um, your planets are terrible. <clears throat> so you have something to work with. Now the bad news is my my viceroy skill is very low. So that might be something, even though it's positive share. I've got these other uh, planets of mine that are taking money away, particularly New Jove. Uh, have a great bio, and then here's Bailey World, which has a terrible viceroy. So uh, I'll need to kind of dive into that, but. Right now, here's my current uh, budget allocation. So basically, you take this 500, um, you divvy it up, um, you know, as much as you want. Now you can have uh, bills that can limit this, and we'll see those maybe later. Um, all right. So military. So right now uh, we're integrating the military system. This will obviously affect you uh, funding your uh, military units, and uh, <clears throat> you're, you'll have to be of a minimum amount, similar to Intel, in order to uh, pay all of your uh, troops. Uh, and then when you go higher than that, you basically improve their morale. <clears throat> so right now what it does is it uh, decreases unrest and it increases your power if you have more military. So um, we'll go ahead and crank it kind of high. Uh, I like to set Intel kind of early because right now, if you set it low, you have a chance of every month of your a squad disbanding because you can't pay them. So I know that based on my Inquisitors, I've got some pretty good ones. So they're going to cost 165 billion credits for the year. Right now, I only have 85 billion allocated, so there's almost a 50% chance at least one of them will will leave, which I really don't want. Um, so I'm going to get that down to zero. Now, if I go above budget, I start getting what's called a uh, informer budget. So I'll go a little bit to show you how that works. Informers are awesome; they give you basically free intel on planets that you want to take a closer look at. So I've got 20 billion allocated for that. I'll show you how that works. I'll go ahead and right click to lock in, and you right click to lock in things. All right, reform. So this is your science. So right now, if I want 125% efficiency, uh, I have to fund it quite a bit. And right now, I can't quite do that unless I want to drop my military, which I really don't want to do. And I don't want to have no domestic because domestic gives you popular support. If you don't fund your domestic, uh, this basically takes care of your people and is basically your day-to-day -day funding of uh, you know that's sent to your plants to make sure that your plants run properly. So you do not want that to go too low. And then finally, savings, anything that you don't spend, you can actually put in savings. Savings goes in your house treasury. So this is very important. So anytime you spend money as the emperor, it comes out of your treasury. If your budget, uh, if you ever fall negative at the end of a year, and remember years now only have four turns, then you have to make up that difference out of your house treasury. If you can't do that, then you lose the game because you've gone bankrupt. Your empire's gone bankrupt and you will be deposed. So do you know... So. You can save whenever. Now, the bad news is I don't really have anywhere that I can save right now because I don't want to lose any Inquisitors. I want to get a good start on um, on my science. And then, but and I definitely don't want to not have any domestic. So what I'm probably going to need to do is just right, left click and let's just kind of maybe bring up to 120%. And then let's get a little bit, let's kind of get that spending together. Now, if I wanted to, I could add a subsidy right now. I could add money from here but it would cost me 25 power. And I really don't want to spend any power right now that I, I can't afford. Power is the absolute most important part of the game. If you go low on power, it's very difficult to make up. Uh, you can fall kind of into a death spiral where your power is so low you can't do anything. So then the, really the only thing you can do is send your military around um, to, to you know, start ruling militarily, which sometimes you have to do, but of course it increases your fear level and then um, makes it harder if you ever lose control at that point, <clears throat> the people will turn against you. So, all right, so we'll go ahead and review the budget. So we've gone ahead and selected it. So the next budget review in four turns. So um, we'll kind of take a look at that. We're going to have a slight surplus, it looks like. Um, we'll kind of take a look at that next turn. The other thing you can do is you can change the householdings tax. Right now it's at 25%. So the problem is, um, oh, there's Hieronymus. Okay, well, they're making a nice. So basically they're paying 25% of this here to me. Uh, I can raise this. I can make I can make it 80% if I wanted, but of course it'll make the other houses very unhappy. And one thing you don't want to do is piss off all the other houses, um, because a big the, a, a one way you win the game is to basically be able to dismantle the council, and you only do that if your power is higher than all the other houses combined. So um, <clears throat> right now we're obviously kind of a far away from that. So um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and close that out. So now our next thing to do is science. So we're gonna go ahead and click on our science nexus. So right now, we now that we have our, our budget, 
um, we have 10.5 basically quintabytes of data that's being generated. So each house generates a certain percentage and it's in large part by their science traditions, how good their scientists are, and frankly how much they like you. Right now, since everybody's Cold War with me, no one's really giving me a lot. Um, Kirley Finn would normally be very good about this, but they hate me. Uh, you see that their um, <clears throat> scientists have an 80 house tradition, so, um, but they may not have that many uh, labs or academies, I'm sorry. Um, so they're not putting out very much right now. So there's a lot of strategies for dealing with science. It's meant to be very simple. Basically, all you're doing is you're distributing every year. You can do a free distribution between reforms, which are essentially uh, political and, and, and uh, uh, demographic, and then your practicals, which basically have to do with hard science, like warfare, ships, uh, military, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> we may actually just change this to um, uh, science and um, diploma or something. We may change the names, but but that's basically what it is. So right now, again, the military system is not really in yet, so there's really no practical reason not to put 100% towards reforms. Obviously, when the military system begins, you're, you won't want to do that. So we'll go ahead and set that up. Now, you as the emperor, so you have 10.5 quintabytes of data that flow through these major categories. So you have diplomacy, divinity, harmony, literacy, prosperity, and supremacy. Um, each one has its own um, reforms. Um, kind of, you can take a look at each of them. It kind of tells you what they do. Right now, every every year, the game checks to see which reforms are available. These are ones that right now the your scientists basically could do, and these do change um, every year. So if you see a reform that you like, um, you probably want to jump on it. <clears throat> like for right now, Viceroy Command Nexus is, is, is very nice. So it increases admin by 10% um, with Holographic Command Center, which is nice. So I think that's something I would want. So I will click on this. So that means it's going to start um, taking this 10.5 and all of it is going to go into diplomacy. Now, another one that I like is Prosperity. Planetary Retail Hubs are very nice. Um, we'll go a little bit more into what retail can do for you. Um, whoops. I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and have that. So what this does, it simply takes 10.5, whatever this number is, for every one you select, it kind of flows into each category. So about five quintabytes uh, will go in each turn. Now, um, the, every amount that you put in, your discovery chance increases. So you have two different phases. You have a discovery chance and then you have a breakthrough chance. So once your discovery chance, you found something, um, once you know this percentage will get higher and higher and every turn there's a roll, and when a roll falls below that percentage, then one of these available reforms will be available. And you don't get to pick, it just is random. And you will see what it is. And you, at that point, you can either kill the project, and then it'll basically roll for another reform. It will, you know, your progress will stay and you'll get another chance to get a different reform. But if you kill it, um, you may never get to uh, research that project ever again. Uh, or you will let the scientists go ahead and, and do that particular project. When you get three... Uh, reforms in a particular category, you go up a level, and that's how you get some of these uh, higher ones that aren't available because you have to have prerequisites, and of course you have to be at that tier. So that's pretty much uh, science. Um, so picking is pretty easy. There's not a lot of micro. Uh, what's important is having a good infrastructure, and right now I'm by far the highest um, you know, output at 4.6, which isn't very much. I mean, you really want to be around 20 uh, plus, maybe even more, especially if you want to do a lot with your... Um, with um, practical research. All right, so we can kind of dig into that in a little bit. We have a lot, kind of a lot to cover. All right, so the next thing I like to do is I like to look at my logistical network. So you can see right now that it covers pretty much everywhere I want to go. It touches these um, provinces. So basically I can go, I can do an exploration, I can colonize anywhere that I have a logistical network, um, I can go to. So over here, if I wanted to explore more in depth over here, I would probably want to build a logistical network to cover this entire uh, constellation because this looks like a really nice planet, but I don't know that much about it um, because I don't have enough intel. And intel is gathered by uh, probing, sending probes, uh, sending scout fleets, or having uh, provinces, or I'm sorry, uh, colonies nearby because they're basically like exploring and they gather information. So. So, so my long-term plans might be to build a, a uh, logistical station there so I can kind of cover that. So, all right. So let's take a look at my Celestial Council. 
So uh, one other thing that's changed is every house is now represented, at least every house. So you can see we have Kirli Finn, Iloa, Waldegrave, Hawkwild, which is me, and then uh, Iagor Alti. So <clears throat> each, <coughs> excuse me, each house is represented um, at least once. So that way uh, everyone has, uh, you know, it, it's not, uh, it makes it harder to kind of block up. Now, I do have one open slot right now, and I can put someone from my house on it right now. Right now I've actually got one, two, and then myself is on there always. But I've got two people already. Uh, and, and the more people you have on your house on the council, um, it provides a negative uh, factor for diplomacy with the other houses because obviously it looks like you're trying to build a power block. Uh, but you'll see where that might be worth it when we start looking at bills. Right now there's no bills, so there's really not much to do here. Uh, this shows the amount of relative power. Um, in the council, it's not one vote is all the same. A vote is weighted by the amount of power they have. So you see this financial prime has 121 power, where this a domestic prime has 323 power. So uh, his vote counts a lot more than his vote. So when you're looking to get a bill to pass or not pass, um, you want to kind of work with people that you already know. And you can see, and we'll kind of go into how that looks uh, once we get a bill. So there's not much to do right, th right there right now. Um, take a quick look at our planets. Uh, this is kind of a quick overview. <clears throat> this kind of gives you you know, their ratings that you know, um, their population, how many farmers, uh, engineers, miners, admins, merchants, um, uh, brr, academics, and fluxmen you have. And of course, the different uh, facilities that you have. So you want basically this number to not be way higher than this number. If this number is lower, it means that you don't have enough people to fill it. If it's higher, it means you have people that don't have jobs. So uh, these are the stockpiles. Uh, since this is New Terra, this is your Empire stockpile. So you can see you have plenty. It corresponds with what's, what's up here. You can always take a look at your stockpiles from here. Um, so we're doing we're doing all right. And then of course this is the out output. So you can get that information on the economic screen as well. But it's just another place to put it. So um, all right, let's take a closer look at New Terra. You can go straight from there. You can kind of take a closer look. So New Terra is kind of here by itself. Um, right now, resource needs the the Viceroy thinks it needs food. It's actually got plenty of food. That's probably something I'm going to work on uh, on fixing. All right, so we're going to take a look at the economics of New Terra. So right now the total revenue is 374 billion credits. So how we get there, we have 816 base GPP, and I'm going to put a tool tip that kind of breaks that down, but this is pushed in large part by the planet's uh, value and their development level. So a development level is generated by having basically nicer pops a plant that has a lot of farmers and miners is going to have a low development level because farmers and miners can't really afford much. But if it has a lot of admins and merchants, then it will be a lot higher because typically they can buy nice stuff. Anyway, so of this 816, um, there's also 166 being generated with retail. Now, retail is a very important concept and one that you really have to pay attention to, um, especially early in the game because you don't really, you're not really making a lot of money. So we look at retail. So retail is just a kind of a concept where every planet has a different retail level. And retail is generated through, um, uh, through basically resources. So uh, re retail takes food, energy, basic materials. Uh, they don't take heavy or rare. Heavy and rare are used more for science and, and military. Uh, but you can kind of see on, on the tooltip, right now we're using 0.9 resources for retail. We're using 0.1 energy and 0.3 food. So we're not really using a lot of resources, even though we have a significant net resource flow. That's pretty common um, because it's the home planet. It's kind of like Trantor in the, the Foundation series. It really isn't self-sustainable, which is why you have to have your trade networks working well. So, but we have a we have a huge stockpile. I mean, we're fine for a long time. So um, what I like to do is, is generally increase the retail allocation um, quite a bit. Now, when you do that, right now it's really small. It's like 3% which that's why we're not using a lot of stuff. The efficiency is how many merchants you have uh, versus the size of the planet. Now we have half a billion people on the planet. Uh, when I go to my trade, I see I have 125 merchants. So um, ideally, so in other words, to have 100% full saturation on the planet to be able to service every uh, pop fully effectively, I would need about 250 merchants. 
Um, but 50% is still good. I mean, that's not a bad thing. You, where you kind of get concerned is when you only have a 5 or 10% efficiency. At that point, it's not really worth putting a lot of money in your retail because you don't have the infrastructure. So think of it as like you don't have, you could be building all the goods in the world, which is what the allocation represents. It's basically saying, I want to start building more retail goods, you know, which is over here. Okay, great. I want to use more energy and basic and, and food to do that. Well, if there's efficiency is low, it means there's nowhere to sell them. There's no shops, there's no malls, there's no online infrastructure. Basically, there's no way to get the goods to the people. And that's where merchants come in. So that's why you need to get merchants. The more merchants you have, the higher skill they have, then the more uh, efficiency goes up. So um, network, there's no network right now. This is where I was talking about. You can have a um, retail network. You can have a local trade network, like a planetary network, system network, and a province network. And those kind of give you bonuses towards efficiency. And then here shows materialism. So each culture um, has a materialism rating. So basically the higher it is, the more they want stuff. Um, so like I say, Neo America is pretty generic. Um, they want their stuff, but they're not fanatical about it, but they are pretty interested in shopping. This is about a, about a six or seven on a, on a 10 scale. So what basically I'm looking at this, it would be worth, since I have a good efficiency, I'm already making quite a bit of money um, on the retail and the materialism is fairly high, I think it would be worth uh, pushing more allocations. So the way to do that, I talk to my Viceroy, I go to Assignment Actions, and one of the many things I can do is change retail allocation percentage. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna change it to about 20%. Um, we don't wanna go too high because we don't, the, more, the higher this goes, the more goods are going to be used, and we don't want to crash our our uh, production. So, um, actually, we'll do we'll do twenty five percent. And you can see here we're friends. There's no need to intimidate. Um, you know, this score is super low. There's no reason on earth this person should not want to do this. So you can see, uh, truly appreciate your confidence. I believe that the intelligent decision. All right. So now, um, you see now the retail allocation has been increased. So now when we go when we go back to retail, now we're at 187 billion credits. Um, and see, so now our, and this hasn't updated yet, but you see it's already made a difference in our expected GPP of 21 GPP. So, um, and now of course increases as, as the goods are made. So, but now you see the expected, see now the goods now 6.7 for retail, uh, 0 0.4 and 2.7. So now we've increased that as well. There's a lot more basic used for retail than there is energy and and uh, and uh, food. All right. And then last is your import and export. Uh, right now, there's no trade going on. Um, uh, this is your civilization capital, so they can trade with anyone that has a trade, uh, any province trade hub or anyone in their pr uh, trade group. And then infrastructure. So we're losing basically infrastructure is. Um, the cost of upkeep. Planets that are nice don't cost as much to upkeep. Um, planets that are nasty, you know, lava planets and you know, uh, um, radiated planets and whatnot, they cost a lot. So this kind of reflects the cost of having a planet that maybe it could be a good outpost, or maybe you just have to have a out a, a colony, but it's going to cost a lot to build, you know, domes and and the infrastructure for certain planets. So one thing you can do if you're trying to save money is one of the options you have as a project is to, um, and I can't pick any projects right now because I don't have enough AP, it takes two AP for a project, is you can actually reduce excess infrastructure. So if I go to my overview mode, I can take a look. Now these are my habitable tiles. These are regions. Each region, think of it as like kind of a country um, on the planet's surface, and they kind of have their own values. So you can see the, I'll go ahead and click on one. So you can see the population. Here's the infrastructure. Like you can see there's no overcrowding. If I kind of look through here, I don't really have any tiles that are being overcrowded right now. So it might be a good, and I can kind of look, and this is, you know, to get kind of a, a close eye view of your planet, uh, you will be able to actually focus on a region for development. If you see a region that's not being utilized or, you know, it's got say this one has, this is an ice region, um, large enclaves, not a lot of people like to live out in the ice, um, but there's not really a lot of development. There's just looks like a couple of mines um, but you probably would want to put more mines out here. So what you can, what you will be able to do is actually designate this region for development to your viceroy, and they will prioritize it when uh, building new sectors. So um, that's it's not it's kind of a not a way to micromanage, but it's a way to kind of nudge your viceroy and say, hey, I see this has this is a big area of land that needs to be developed. So when you build some mines, put them here. It's basically what what you'd be saying. So anyway, and that's in your overview. All right, so we've kind of taken a look at my situation. So 
given that I have two primary goals right now, and this is your Grand Vizier, and this is kind of another place you can go, um, gives you some potential goals. So I got a lot that I could be doing. I'm short on holdings. I don't have that many holdings. Um, my gross empire product should be about two, 2,000. That way it will be enough to fund pretty much everything I need to do. I don't have any projects going. Projects are a good way to increase your power. And I don't have any allies. So and that's, that's pretty tough. So um, I think what I want to do is I want to try to gain an ally. And I want to try, I probably want to try Van Rigel. Now they are traditionalist. Traditionalists typically don't get along with most of the other houses. Uh, as you can see, they're not allied with anybody and, and uh, because they're kind of uh, and, you know, religious, they kind of keep to themselves. You know, they're very, you know, like again, think of like Puritans or Quakers. So, um, <clears throat> and they're also the strongest. Now, Iloa has a lot of money, uh, but they don't have a lot access to a lot of ADM. Uh, actually, um, uh, Kirli Finn has access to a lot of ADM. Uh, and we'll talk about ADM next turn. But basically, it's uh, admin points that houses can use to build their own projects and do their own things. Um, so I think I want, and, and see right now, they have a high manufacturing tradition. Um, and Iloa has a strong mining tradition. So when you have a house that is uh, not happy with you, like Cold War, generally their people won't work with you. Which means if I wanted to put a Viceroy in from that was good with mining... Um, which I might want to do. Like if I go to, let's go to New Terra again, and let's say I want to get more mines. Actually, well here, let's do this. So I've got, where do I, okay, so I've got, um, we've got Luminescence here. Okay, we'll just take a look there. And so they've got a ton of mines. So we'll go in, we'll take a look at their employment. So they've got basically full employment. I mean, there is not a single person that's not working, which is phenomenal, which means they're gonna have a great, when you look at their, um, whoops, when you look at their public order, very high, everybody's happy, um, lots of love in the air, you know, they've, everyone's got jobs. So that's kind of exciting. So when we look at their production, so they do have a positive resource flow, you know, but you would think with so many mines, you would think they would do even better. So because they have 18 miners and they have all the mines they actually have 31 mines that are available so well, let's take a look at their stats and they have a and they have a 78 average basic rating an 80 average heavy rating a 34 which is actually good i mean this is a phenomenal planet i need to be looking at this planet as a um hub for getting materials which means i you know i need them to release them and have better relations but the first thing i want to do is take a look at their mining skills. So I don't know, I'm actually running this planet. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I don't think I have very good mining skill. So I don't know right now. Right now it's a question mark. Um, so let's see if I can get to know him and see if I can get any more information. That's gonna be, okay, we're friends now. So you can see my trust increased. Okay, but I still didn't get any information um, about that. So I don't have any more AP, so I can't assign an inquisitor. But this is somewhere where I might want to replace him if he's got a low mining skill. It means he's not getting the most out of his mining apparatus. Um, and let's see what he's working on. So he's building, focusing on admin. So he's got 116 build points. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, engineers. Well, there's only three engineers actually. So uh, he's getting a tremendous amount. So he must have a really good engineering skill. Oh, and he does. He's got 100 engineering. And he's got uh, a very high uh, intelligence. So, and he's got a hundred government skills. So that's very important. So this guy is actually really good for what he does. So this government skill basically means he's very good at importing his knowledge uh, to the planet. So even if he had a hundred here, so he may know all everything in the world about about uh, engineering. But if he can't show, if he can't, you know, increase the factories and put in you know, better protocols and things like that, which is basically what that represents. If you can't make it stick on a planetary level, then it doesn't matter. So this is a big bottleneck for that sort of thing. So this skill is really important. It basically affects how well he can or she can um, get the other skills on there. So he's doing a really great job there. Uh, so even with three engineers, they're putting out 116 build points, which is phenomenal. Um, but he's building more admin. So this is a system capital, so that may not be the worst thing ever but he's putting a little bit into um, more energy and it looks like he's building, putting just a little bit for mine, which is good. You don't want him to do that because they've got plenty of mines. 
um, that's actually not bad. And he's building, putting a little bit for admin too. I mean, for infrastructure. Um, so I'm curious, which area 441, I'm curious, I wonder if they're overpopulating. Ah, yes, he's got a tile that's over, overcrowded. All right, he's de okay, so it's an ocean planet, that's why. So, yeah, he's got definitely some tiles. So he is putting some into infrastructure, which infrastructure basically means he's building, you know, more towns, more places for people to live, so they will stay happy, um, which is good. You want to do that in the long run. Um, we we'll look at the GPP, see what he's doing over here. He's got a little bit of retail going on. Infrastructure is going to be more expensive on a planet like this. Um, so even though he's only got 76 million, um, He's spending a lot relatively for infrastructure. Remember how with New Terra they had half a billion and the infrastructure there was like 500? Uh, because it was a nice planet. It was a, basically a Terran planet. This is an ocean planet. So you're having to build a lot of islands and a lot of kind of sub-habitable type stuff. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's going to cost more. So we definitely don't want to erase any of it because we're already kind of to the limit. Uh, we can kind of see how much infrastructure is already there. Um, that's the level of infrastructure. Um, so you can see even with that few of people, because again, because it's an ocean planet, um, it's not enough. So he's doing what he needs to be doing. So I'll basically leave him alone. I'll try to get to know him a little bit better in the next turn and kind of see about getting, uh, getting that stuff out. Okay. So, um, that's just saying that there, we've been friends. All right. So we're going to go ahead and end it here. Um, oh, one last thing, Intel. We want to take a look at the intel. So we've got already two rumors going. We don't know that much about it. These are um, minor things. Each minor is minor things are real small things. Like they're just trying to gain power. They're trying to get to know someone. It's basically just characters doing character things in the world. Um, where you want to be concerned is where you have major and capital um, plots. Capital plots like assassinations. Um, major plots are things like intimidation, bribery. Um, um, intimidation, interrogation, that kind of thing. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit more when we actually have a plot worth looking at. So these are my three Inquisitors. Um, right now I've got a really good one. This guy's got a four um, um, espionage skill, which is really good. So if I put him on a mission, which right now I can't do that, he'll, he'll go and do it a lot faster and he'll be a lot more effective. So, okay. Uh, I think we've covered most of the important things. There's a lot to go over. It's a big game, um, but we've covered basically most. So my goals, overarching, are to to continue to increase my uh, economy by focusing on individual planets um, and try to get their uh, situation better under control, which may mean putting new viceroys in or having them build different things, um, to increase my power, and then to try to make at least one friend. And we'll start with Van Rigel. So. Um, we're off to a little bit of a rough start, uh, minus seven, just very, very, very minor things here. So um, and next turn, I should have more AP, and we'll be able to show more, and that's going to be a focus for next turn to see if we can get Van Rigel more on our side. So we'll go ahead and save it here, <clears throat> and we will pick it up next turn, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys then. Thank you very much. Have a great day.